this to the cloud. So welcome. Uh, this is uh, the BC Forward uh, TAPQA Powering Innovation World Class Quality Webinar. I'm very excited to uh, be kicking this off with uh, two of uh, BC Forward's uh, thought leadership uh, fellas in uh, both Brian and Josh. We'll be introducing them in a second. Uh, so we're really excited. This has been a, a series of webinars. This is our last one for the year. Uh, I believe we've done 11 webinars this year, which is uh, fun to see that we only missed one month <laughs> as, uh, as we went through the year and have had a lot of great uh, webinars and topics. Um, all of those can be found out on the TAPQA website. Uh, that's tapqa.com. And uh, all of the, this one will be posted on there probably by this afternoon or tomorrow uh, if you missed something or wanted to listen to it again if you happen to be attending. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so in today's presentation, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a lot about innovation. And the goal here is to better understand uh, what exactly are the building blocks of innovation and how do we really help spark as we go from 2020, which has been kind of a stand still, how do we keep the lights on year to 2021, where there's been a lot of hope and the idea of, hey, let's get back to a growth mindset. And really then in order to grow, we've got to have innovation. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today uh, from really two perspectives, uh, kind of the project management perspective of how do we actually uh, manage this and, and really get it implemented, as well as then more from the quality perspective, uh, so that as we start looking at innovation and the building blocks of that, how do we start also making sure that there's quality with that as well. Uh, with that, I would love to have my two presenters uh, introduce themselves. Josh, could you introduce yourself and talk about your role? Yes, thanks, Michael, and hello, everybody. So Josh Brenneman, the QA Delivery Director at BC Forward. And so I've spent years in consulting in the QA space and team leadership in, of, of, of software quality teams. Um, more recently, my role has changed to more uh, of doing that on a bigger scale. So now I support many of our, our clients, um, ensuring their consultants are hitting their deliverables or doing great work. We have the skills and talent in place, partnering with our clients on, you know, next phases and roadmaps to start their automation journeys or expand their capability or, or what have you. Thanks, Josh. Brian, did you want to introduce yourself as well? Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Brian Whitman. I'm the Agile Program Manager for BC Forward. Um, I oversee uh, all the corporate projects going on um, for BC Forward um, with an agile mindset, um, kind of everything from um, onboarding modernization to some of the proprietary web services that we offer some of our clients, just um, optimizing and standardizing all of our services from within. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're So we'll jump right in. We've got a lot of great topics. Just a a, a point for all of those that are just uh, joining us now. If you do have a question, we'll try to address it. I'll be monitoring the Q&A as uh, both Josh and Brian will be talking about uh, each of the elements uh, as we walk through the presentation. But please feel free to uh, throw something out in the Q&A &A, Q &A, and we'll try to get it addressed as we're going through the presentation. Uh, and then at the end, we'll try to uh, have some Q&A as well. So any questions, please uh, feel free to jump it in there and we will certainly be monitoring that. So uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll start to, to, to dive into the presentation. So when we think about growth, so again, kind of thinking about going from you know, 2020 to 2021, uh, one of the things that I had talked to and asked Josh and Brian about is what are the, what are the things that really does it take to create uh, innovation, which is at sort of the top of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this thing here is, is what, what do we need to do in order to innovate in our, in our organizations? And what we really discussed is the idea that we've really got to have a bunch of key elements as we sort of have, the, have them as building blocks and they're not always to, to scale like this. But I think certainly, you know, starting with business alignment, uh, then just understanding uh, within the organization uh, what change looks like and how, uh, how we can deal with change management. Then from there, really progressing up, uh, looking at what I always say are the big three, which is gonna be people, process, and technology. So that's gonna be the area of focus for us is to, to really understand uh, as an organization, you know, how do we, how do we align with the business? Um, how does our business handle change? And so therefore uh, the ability to get new products or doing things a different way. And then how do we then apply that to people, process and technology? So that's really gonna be the focus of, of our webinar. 
uh, today and very excited about kind of the two different perspectives that we'll be talking about uh, when it comes to this, uh, looking at those five elements. So let's dive in a little bit deeper and double click into change management, or excuse me, a business alignment. So business alignment, you know, when we think about business alignment, we really think about the idea of, uh, you know, having uh, both IT and the business and any other organization really come together and uh, sort of have a, a common view. And I'd really love it if, if uh, Brian could kind of kick us off here uh, in terms of kind of how those two go together from a, a project management perspective. Absolutely, Mike. Um, and kind of uh, exactly as you said, um, business alignment is about having all of the different organizations within the business, IT, finance, sales, recruiting, um, all of those aspects need to have a common goal, an ongoing relationship, and sometimes it's projects that tie all of them together. Um, scope is a big one, a big, uh, a big component of understanding business alignment all the organizations within your company need to be uh, a lot uh, <clears throat> need to be uh, on the same page understanding the scope understanding what's in and out, as well as what is out of scope for the business to be aligned um, into to, to really To really capitalize on those projects, uh, businesses a business alignment is is needed to uh, 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 well. Uh, really, what I'm getting at is quality. Business alignment. You're going to miss out on some quality if 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 finance or IT um, recruiting is out of a, a alignment with with what you're trying to accomplish in a project. Josh, did you want to build on that from a, a QA perspective and talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think Brian's right on that alignment piece across the departments is, is absolutely critical. And to take that, you know, a bit more in a focused, uh, you know, QA space direction, that that collaboration between the, the QA testers and the business is also critical because, you know, it's, it's important and more natural for that dev and B and, and QA collaboration. That's important too. But ultimately, the, the QA success is not based off of test case passing and code coverage. It's fast to, it, it goes back to, um, you know, does, does the business priorities work the way they're intended? Um, and that kind of collaboration and tie back to the real world of what the business needs and expects and how they prioritize the testing, what they, what they value the most is where the, is where the true collaboration success of a QA team will come in. Got to, to, to jump on, on a line with that, the pipelines throughout qual quality pipelines have QC uh, quality checks throughout them. Uh, it goes along with my concept of, of scope management there. Um, profiles, programs, and projects, that hierarchy really helps understanding alignment as it goes. Those QC checks, if an uh, organization kind of gets bumped out or, or is struggling with what they're aligning, what the scope is, um, the pipelines really help with those checks and, and ensuring that quality stays the same. Mm -hmm. You know, guys, one of the things that I most often hear is that, you know, or I think we, we've maybe seen this a lot is the idea that, you know, the, the business says, all right, you know, here's, here's what you're, we're going to give you to go get something done. And then, you know, IT or the, you know, the phone comes in and says, well, it's going to take, you know, you know, 20 people and millions of dollars. And then the, and then the business says, all right, you can have two people and $10. And so, you know, can you guys talk a little bit about risk and maybe how we then address that risk is, is clearly sometimes there's misalignment between, you know, the work that needs to be done versus maybe the budget shortfalls that we may have. Yeah. Sorry, please, Brian. Josh, go ahead. No, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Hey, I think, I think all of our, our QA minded folks on the call will, <laughs> I identify with that comment, right? We always need to do way more in the time that's allotted, right? And so, which is okay. I think we need to step off the high horse and realize that there are legitimate needs for the timeline shifting or not shifting the way we need them to. Uh, but it's back again for that collaboration piece. And I, I like to put as much of that decision then um, back onto the business uh, leaders, right? And so, okay, if this truly is the direction we have to go based off budget and not based off what my, my estimates said we need, then help me do the best job I can within those parameters, right? So here's, um, 
here's the testing that we can do in that time. Here's what we're not going to be able to do. So help us risk-based prioritize the testing that we're going to accomplish. Um, if you are fortunate enough to, to, to look into the future and plan that way, you can even have your business help you define your personas, which is a design thinking sort of approach. But help us understand your most you know, active user segment or your most profitable user segment. And we'll gear our testing around the lens of, of that particular end user to make, to make, you know, again, to maximize the testing time that we do have. Yeah, Josh hit a great point there. It was a decision uh, was the key word that I was going to focus on. I create decision logs with my projects uh, that helps understand if there's any shift in scope, alignment, budget, a risk pops up, the team knows knows who to contact to make a decision, how to mitigate that risk. It's all outlined at the beginning of a project along with a, a risk log. You know, what happens, what, what could potentially happen? We're seeing this coming down the pipeline. How would we mitigate it when it comes down? Who's going to take responsibility and what actions need to be taken? So that's that from a project management standpoint, decision, decision logs and, and risk logs are very, very important. Yeah, no, yeah, those are... Sorry, go ahead, Judge. No, I was just gonna uh, just just to scan uh, beyond beyond that, that. That's definitely the the, the critical pieces to kind of get out of a, a jam, right? We're thinking about mitigating risk and, and making the best of a given scenario. I, I think it's important just to also look ahead, right? And again, think about how we can um, uh, instead of reacting to situations, think about how we can just do it right the first time, right? And that's really comes to back again into into alignment. And that's why this one topic, this initial building block is so important, right? But if we, we want our testers to understand the business and, and to test the application like the business does, and your day in the life scenarios of having your end users really walk through how they use the system could be really important for the QA people not to take shortcuts and not just to test it to get their test case to work, but to actually test it the right way. And also to, to really take the time and explain what automation can do, right? It's not, again, it's if you pull it in as a, a last minute, oh my gosh, I have so many tests, I gotta run, I need to automate. <laughs> you're not as likely to succeed as if you understand that aut what automation does is frees up the repetitive um, kind of ongoing resource needs so that you can, you can do a lot with less, but you have to start that journey early to really maximize the benefit. No, those are great points, Josh. I, I think, you know, one of the, the nuggets that I always uh, think that I take away from this is, uh, you know, documentation is, is, a, is a great thing. Um, you know, I think there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of ways, both technology and otherwise to do it. But, uh, you know, having that great way of documenting something, I think certainly helps us to, uh, to sort of mitigate that risk. So, or at least uh, from us quality people, we at least get to go, see, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's move on um, as uh, we wanted, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, change management and, you know, really kind of dive into, you know, organizations deal with change in, in a lot of different ways. Um, Brian, did you want to kick us off here just on, on kind of some different ways that organizations deal with change management? Absolutely. Uh, from a project management perspective, I approach change management from a very base level. Um, so we're talking about, you know, if there's just a small little tweak in a process or um, a, a small little change in work instructions that kind of influence how a team will communicate with another team. Um, from a project management standpoint, change management is incredibly important as far as documentation, um, training, and um, just general alignment goes. If a small little change, uh, you know, even if it's with a culture change or a small little, you know, um, a role change for someone, that can have a big impact on how the team kind of, of, of operates as a whole. Um, and so for me, change management is incredibly important from, you know, those small little ones to even large operational changes. No, that's great. I, I, I think that's a great kind of uh, foray into, into, you know, what change management is. And, you know, let, let, maybe we talk a little bit more of just some examples of, of how you guys have, have really sort of embraced that or implemented that at organizations. Well, I think um, there's, 
you know, there are, there are situational elements here that could kind of, you know, impact the, the advice I'd give, right? Between jumping in to change, not being afraid, and just uh, growing from failure, right? You fail fast to learn from it. And there, there definitely is places where I, 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 I do recommend that strategy and that kind of thinking. In other cases, there is just a, a, a strong need for intentionality. And so one area, you know, again, that, uh, back into the testing uh, frame of mind, just a, a, a large question is just how can we automate? How can we, how can we do better here? And so we really recommend that you take some time to assess, you know, your processes, your collateral, your documentation, your people, and just to really make sure that you, you, you have the right information to make the right decisions and not to dive into something that will ultimately not succeed, not succeed because, you know, it, it, it could take more, more alignment or some other changes that you have to really make sure that your documentation hand off between the BA or PO and the dev back to QA. You might need to introduce some BDD along with your kind of automation changes or implementations that you want to make to really be successful. And that's just where we, we advise and like we recommend taking the time to do the assessment and kind of the legwork up front. Hey, hey, Josh, before we, we maybe have Brian give some of his examples, could you talk and maybe describe a little bit more about what behavioral driven development is? Yeah, there's, you know, probably a, a whole separate webinar to be had on the topic, but I think, I think it's just a really helpful framework slash, slash methodology, right, for just ensuring that that um, uh, alignment between the, the, the various groups. And you hear a lot of the, the three amigos kind of uh, terminology when you're doing BDD type of work. And that's really just to make sure that your stories are being, um, you know, written in, in, in a way, you know, again, from the PO, from the, usually the PO side or BA side, um, it typically favors a, a cucumber slash gherkin format. And then that really drives then the kind of the standard uh, and process for how developers would would take said functionality, um, and then also you know with that collaboration back to the tight QA um, component, um, ensuring that it works the way intended. So it really ensures that strong sync between those three pieces of the dev puzzle to ensure that the right things being being built. Yeah, I I completely agree with you, Josh. Uh, didn't just kind of piggyback off of you um, that behavior driven. Uh, concept is is really in, in, in for development as well as um, just a general project uh, awareness, so especially around change management. Living documentation is probably my best example of change management. Being able to change, update, distribute, and learn from a piece of documentation through all the different steps of a project from beginning to close is incredibly important because what it does is it leaves you a spring at the end of a project, it leaves you a springboard into your next project within a, in a, in a program within a portfolio. Um, my next uh, example is just onboarding and kind of coupled with that is offboarding. If you don't have a dedicated team, I know, I know I'm, I'm speaking from an agile mindset where, you know, dedicated teams are, are, are the best practice, but, you know, some people, some, some companies don't have the luxury of being able to have a dedicated team where you've kind of got these team members going here and there. I'm not talking about onboarding and offboarding from a company. I'm talking about onboarding, offboarding for a team. So if you have documentation that is constantly updated, work instructions, processes, uh, these documents, you know, helping and guiding individuals on, you know, how to perform a certain task in a tool or how to communicate the handoffs. Josh mentioned handoffs, and that's during change management, if there's a small little, you know, small little loop of communication that's been changed, a handoff can be missed. And if that's not documented or expressed or communicated to, you know, a newly onboarded member of your team that's on a brand new project, you know, the ball can be dropped here and there. Uh, and these are just small little examples, uh, you know, just the small ones. You know, we haven't even talked about cultural change management. You know, there's a lot out there, you know, concerning alignment, change management, and uh, it, it all building up to innovation. If you don't have change management in these small little facets, facets of your teams, of your projects, you know, innovation is going to, you're going to struggle. It's going to be, it's going to be hard to be inventive. Um, 
But if you accomplish these small little behavioral driven um, concepts here, innovation will come to you. Yeah, I think those are, uh, are all great points. I, I think, Brian, you, you bring up another interesting point just around, you know, getting outside of maybe the bounds of, of, say, IT development, but even into more of just that cultural view of how do organizations, you know, adapt to change. And I, I think certainly this year we've, we've all had to adapt to uh, some change, but it'll be interesting to see as we continue to move forward uh, about, you know, working with one another, these changes happen. But I, I think one of the things that also found with organizations is finding out who your change champions are in your organization can be incredibly helpful. And, uh, and they certainly do not have to come at the leadership level. And a lot of times they aren't at the leadership level. So knowing who those folks are, they're going to help, you know, do things differently, uh, be able to think uh, and, and absorb that, that th those are great folks to really uh, glom onto. And uh, I think there's an array of different ways of, of finding them, but make a change and see who doesn't yell. And that's usually your change agents. So, uh, but uh, let's, let's move on. Um, the, uh, the next slide that we wanted to talk about was people and just kind of how, uh, you know, starting to look more than in depth at, at people process and technology. Josh, I, I thought maybe you could kick us off on this one. Yeah, I think I mean, it's such a critical area, right? And I think there's been a lot of focus over the past several months of, of how this has changed, right? In the dispersed world and, and all those sorts of things. And there's great information and discussion to be had around that. But I think as I was thinking about what I wanted to say for this topic of this webinar, what really struck out to me kind of just really wanted to highlight was just don't, don't wait, right? People are not waiting around anymore for things to get back to whatever normal is gonna look like. Our, our innovators um, want to innovate now, right? Our performers are gonna perform the kind of uh, folks who want, are up and comers are they're continuing to grow in their careers. No one's gonna be complacent waiting around for things to kind of get back to a spot where we feel like we can do that again. So I just would encourage people to invest the time into your, into your people. Um, we need to uh, do really do a good job of, of you know, finding out what people's passions are give them opportunity to, to follow those things, be creative in how you can, uh, you know, empower people within the confines of, of, you know, obviously there still needs to get the work done, right? Obviously there are constraints that make this challenging, but we need to be resourceful um, it, to really uh, uh, attract and, and retain the, the top talent, the best people that we have in our organizations. Yeah, thanks Josh, that's great. Brian, do you want to continue to kick us off here with uh, some more just examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to to tag on to what Josh is saying, I think now is the time. Uh, he was talking about coaching and 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 really uh, um, uh, enhancing the talent that people have. I think now is the time that cross functional, cross organizational uh, team members is 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 now. When everyone's working remote, it's best to have individuals that can understand and cross-function from team to team or from organization to organization to at very least know how they communicate with each other back and forth. Um, and this goes back to a safe environment for feedback. In a project, when we complete a project, I like to sit everyone down in an agile project, we have a retrospective in a more traditional, pro or a more traditional uh, it's more of just a AARP after action review process uh, where we sit down, produce a safe environment, maybe talk about things we didn't do so well, but definitely talk about the things that we did well, highlight both of them, talk about how can we improve ourselves as a team and then not only just as a team, but as an, an organization. How did our organization communicate with this other organization? How did our handoffs go? How can we as a company come together and you know, improve our own processes from within, therefore creating our outward services to our clients that much better? 
Hey, Brian and Josh, we had a, a question from uh, one of the attendees about just uh, if we have a recommendation for following a standard process uh, for change management like ITIL or I4IT. So do you guys have any thoughts around, you know, is there a, you know, should we always be implementing a standard process or, you know, how do we, how do we help, you know, foster change within an organization? That's a great. I'll, I'll go ahead, Josh. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there is a, a a standard for change management. I believe that from a project management standpoint, right? That's 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 where I'm taking this from. Change management, the way I understand it and the way I utilize it within my projects, is I sit everyone down um, at the beginning of a project and we just like Josh kind of pointed out and what he'll probably speak to is looking ahead, looking ahead and understanding, you know, it comes back to risk. Change management and risk kind of live together in this weird, awkward relationship in which some risk can pop up and then change management is right there. That's why, you know, Mike, you were talking, you know, your, your change leaders are going to be those that don't, you know, yell when, when change comes down the road. Um, and I think the best practice or the, the best standardized uh, procedure moving forward with that is understanding a risk log. And then that risk log is going to tell you pretty much where you need to start identifying where those changes are going to start flowing in from and then attack it from there. Yeah. I, I, I think that's just the best piece of advice that I could give as well. And, and just, I think the, the only thing I would add is just, you know, those, those um, standards that you, that were mentioned are, you know, I think of them like a tool. You know, this could be a, an amazing tool for your organization that really helps. It does. It takes away a lot of the, maybe some of the you know, investigation and legwork into defining areas, right? If it, if it's done for you and it's there, I would absolutely take advantage of it. But it's not necessarily going to right size every organization, or it doesn't necessarily fit in every organization or every process, right? So I would just take a look at what you really need to accomplish. And then take a look at the tools to get there, but don't necessarily force it onto an area where it doesn't necessarily naturally fit. Oh, that's great, guys. No, thanks for answering that. The uh, you know before we move on from people, one of the the pieces that I did want to talk about was uh, introverts and, and extroverts. For uh, some of us like myself that are more extroverted, you know, we've all been dying a slow death here for the last nine months. So, um, you know, I, but I thought I would maybe, you know, have you guys talk a little bit more about just, you know, when you're engaging people, uh, you know, regardless of whether they're introverts or extroverts, you know, how are you engaging people and, uh, and how do you continue to engage them, uh, you know, regardless of kind of what they're, uh, whether they're introverted or extroverted? Um. I'll do, I got a quick answer for this one because uh, I'm I'm more of an extrovert myself, um, so I try to be very, uh, very alertive and very responsive to when I'm able to identify if someone's an introvert or an extrovert. Uh, from a project management standpoint, I will schedule one-on-ones uh, with individuals that don't necessarily speak up, and because I know they have brilliant insights, they have brilliant feedback. They just they're in a meeting with six or seven people and they kind of get trampled on or, or don't get a chance to actually give their feedback. I'll schedule one-on-ones with them and then um, encourage them to, to speak up in meetings and then try to guide the conversation towards them during, during meetings. Um, extroverts are, are a little bit different. Um, uh, one myself, I feel the pain a lot. Um, I, I turn my video on. I try to schedule some, some fun things we do uh, coffee breaks, we do some happy hours, we do um, some holiday get togethers, those kinds of things to really get the extroverts feeling like they're not just stuck at home, working from home. Yeah, yeah thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I echo all those things. I tend to keep a running uh, Zoom going all day long with my with my little bookmarked link and just you know, sends off to people multi, every, every gap I get throughout the day. I'm usually sending someone to Zoom to come chat about something and try and make the most of each conversation and make every, um, you know, make every discussion kind of have a, have a, a point and sort of some kind of, some kind of goal and, and rhyme or reason to it. Well, thanks, Josh. The, uh, you know, one of the, the next things we wanted to talk about was technology and just sort of where technology plays a part in this in terms of innovation. So one of the things we, uh, we, 
wanted to talk about was kind of some requirements and uh, not necessarily specific tools, although I think we'll call a few out. But uh, Josh, did you want to kick us off again here on kind of your uh, your thoughts around some some deep requirements that we should have? Yeah, right. I think we are like like you said, all across the board, and we all have our we all have our favorites, right? And so I think we will talk about those. I know um, uh, for me, this this different you know this exercise of being remote has has. Uh, I, I have changed my approach in quite a few areas, and I think some of these will definitely have been very useful and we'll keep going back to even when we're back at offices as normal. Um, so, you know, I think uh, the collaboration tools that we mentioned have gotten extremely valuable, but for me, the probably the, uh, the newest way of communicating, which I didn't used to do, would be around the mind mapping. Um, I think on the next slide, we maybe call it out as a more of a specific uh, uh, bullet, but it's it's... If you guys don't know what mind mapping is, you should really look into it a little bit. There are some other, uh, some great communications around what it what it does, but it's just been it's been shown how um, how how effective a visual representation is, right? As far as the impact that it has on your audience, right? As opposed to words, like your what it does to people's brains and retention is just is powerfully demonstrated that uh, a visual just really goes a long way, um, and so. So one thing I've been doing is using you know, kind of uh, a mind map uh, way of demonstrating relationships and showing how, you know, if you have a central idea, how different pieces kind of tie into it, how they relate to each other as well. So you can kind of put your arrows in, you could draw a little, um, you know, uh, little pictures to kind of help, help, help make a point and, and, you know, point to different areas of process and kind of show some of that some of that stuff in a way that's more meaningful to your audience than just a, a, a list, right? Like then this happens, then this happens. So that's it, kind of probably my biggest um, uh, kind of new insight that I wanted to share. Well, that's great. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Brian, what are your thoughts around technology? Yeah, I, I would be remiss not to talk about a learning management system during remote times, such as these uh, learning management systems are by far one of the most important communication, collaboration, compliance tools that you can have. Uh, it is, it is the uh, you know, it is the essence of being able to communicate and not just with your own company, but or within your own uh, local area, but also globally. Global live taught sessions. Uh, documentation, knowledge base, all that great stuff all in one system. Uh, th I would say that was by far the most SaaS software as a service uh, maxima uh, maximization that, that you could use uh, as far as a tool goes. Um, a Jamboard, kind of taking a step back to the introvert and extrovert conversation we had, a Jamboard or a whiteboard, uh, as they're called, or a you know, Microsoft whiteboard, is a great way to kind of ice break, get an icebreaker or, or kind of pull some people out of their shells because um, you get the collaboration in there as well. People, you know, writing up stickies, you know, they can be fun. It can be very interactive. Um, it gets kind of people... Uh, at least contributing and participating in the kind of uh, work that you're contributing, especially during retroactives, things people don't necessarily want to have to do. They just finished a project, but a Jamboard kind of gets them excited and want to talk with their other other teammates, you know, maybe write a joke on there, so on and so forth. And then my last uh, piece that's not necessarily up there, but it goes with collaboration is version control. Um, version control now time now in remote times is ever more important. You, passing an Excel sheet when you're in the office is is pretty easy to do without overriding or uh, saving over someone else's work. But if you're emailing a, a, a spreadsheet around using Microsoft Teams, uploading it and letting it you know operate as a shared living document, I can see when when Jim is in there, I can see when Cindy is in there and I'm not writing over their work, it's all version controlled and I understand, I can go back and look at the history of them. I, th I think those are by far some of the best uh, pieces of technology to utilize uh, during a, a remote uh, a situation that we're living in. No, thanks guys, that's a, that's a good, good overview. I, uh, I, I would definitely uh, sort of echo what uh, Josh had mentioned around mind maps. Uh, those are those are really fun, um, and I'm a visual kind of person as well. I think many people are, but just 
uh, the idea of being able to do less words and more pictures is, uh, I don't know, it's kind of fun. It's like coloring for adults, I guess, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, let's let's kind of uh, move on and talk about uh, process optimization. The, this was our, uh, our, our favorite picture of the slideshow. You can all probably figure out why, uh, but we know, uh, I, think, I think process gets harped on a lot uh, when it comes to, you know, how do we really get to innovate and is there some, you know, can you get a, a standard process that'll always give us innovation or, or growth? And uh, I don't think the answer is yes, or there is one, but I, I do believe that it does play a part. Um, Brian, did you want to, um, there we go. Uh, did you want to kick us off here just in terms of kind of ideas around process optimization? Absolutely. Um, I think we all like to believe that process optimization just as that picture has showed us is a linear, uh, a linear operation. Unfortunately, it usually isn't. Um, for me as a project manager, I really evaluate kind of what step we're at in our process, look forward and understand where do we need to go. And sometimes you have to take a step back during your process optimization to really understand where you're going and where you know forward is. Um, very much like Josh has mentioned a few times with, with optimization is that you've got to understand where you are to know where you're going forward. Um, and that goes along with expectations, your process optimization, think about scope, think about risk, think about where your end goals are, what are the expectations down the road? Because you're going to, you're going to have goals that you're going to want to meet for that process. Really personally for me. I think I, I, I assess the team, look at the team, where, how are we communicating with each other? How are we communicating our updates? How are we, you know, utilizing our tools? That is the best way to really optimize a process, really look at the pain, critical thinking. That's your, that's your key buzzword takeaway from, from prop to process optimization is critical thinking. Think about where those pains are, what's causing that pain, um, how can we solve that pain? And that's just one step, one, one, one building block in optimizing your process. Um, there's a lot more to it, um, but from a project management standpoint, that's kind of where I, I really just, uh, from a very granular view, right? Um, that's, that's where I'm looking to optimize the processes in my team. Josh, what, uh, what are your thoughts around process optimization from a quality perspective? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I think again with, um, on the global scale, right? And this is obviously uh, gonna impact every organization differently and everyone's view of, of what I'm gonna say next is gonna uh, be, you know, colored by, by the lens that you're viewing this in, right? So mm -hmm. I, I get all that, but from a, you know, the big picture standpoint, I think there's a lot of things shifting right now in our, in our QA space. And it's only uh, wise of us to kind of understand those things and be ready for some things, right? So we have the potential of, of AI and ML kind of uh, uh, processes um, becoming more mainstream, right? We've, we know about them right now. We've heard some talks, but at some point, these things are going to start making more inroads into, like, uh, into our mainstream processes, right? And so how do, we, how do we plan for that? How do we adapt for that? Uh, what is it, what's it gonna do? It does not, it's not going to eliminate um, uh, QA jobs, right? There's still a lot of things that, that only humans can bring to the table, but understanding that a lot of maybe hours of what I do every day won't be needed anymore um, we should be thinking ahead to what new processes can only a human add value to and start thinking about those, right? Start thinking more about what if we really focus on the end user satisfaction as a component of quality and not just my internal test case pass, my own test cases passing and things like that. So I, like I said, I, I think there's at the, at the high level view, there's some really major things that are probably going on and it's, it's smart to really start thinking about how we can, we can adjust our internal processes um, as the changes are coming down the pike. 
No, I, I think that's a great, great thoughts, uh, Josh. You know, one one of the things that I wanted to, to ask you both about, and I think this kind of builds off that, is the idea that, you know, whether it's through automation currently or whether it's about some, you know, new automation coming, uh, I think that, you know, organizations are starting to get more and more and more data that they are faced with, just whether it's from a reporting perspective or just, you know, there's just more data coming at us these days. Uh, and so, you know, how how should organizations be preparing to sort of optimize for the fact that that's only gonna grow, right? Uh, it's like no different than apparently the pictures on my iPhone, right? <laughs> They're just gonna get more, right? And uh, for whatever reason, the size keeps going up. So, you know, it'd be great to, to better understand from your guys' perspective is how, do, how should organizations be preparing for just the continued, you know, almost exponential increase in data that we've got to account for? Well, Mike, I can kick you off by telling, telling or, you know, advising you what not to do um, in, in some of my former and some of my former wives. Um, I worked for a company uh, in a, a data section as a project manager. Um, everything was ad hoc. It was almost as though it was almost as though other organizations within the company would come to would come to this data group and, uh, and ask them, hey, I would like for you to pull up the specs on this project. I would really, really like for you to analyze these numbers that I have in relation to X, Y, and Z. Like it was a, a, a drive through restaurant. They'd come up, give them the order, pump, the scientists would pump it out, turn it over to them, and that was the end of it. And they would say, bye, good luck with your, good luck with your results. Um, rather than having a, a hierarchy, some kind of pipeline, some kind of alignment with all of these other organizations within their company. So if, if you're going to have an uncertain amount of, um, or an uncertain amount of data, you've got to be in line with how you're going to use it, how you're going to deploy it, how you're going to implement it, how you're going to use it. Um, it, 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 you really need to have that kind of thought out from the very beginning and, and have an alignment across uh, all of the organizations. Josh, what, what's your perspective on just that as well within the quality space? Yeah. Yeah. You're only as good as your data. So that, that is a critically important space. And, um, you know, there's definitely some very helpful, uh, rules around good, uh, data governance. You know, I think it's important to uh, to put in place your um, uh, your compares, right? Where data is housed in in multiple systems and integrations are, um, you know, in all of our organizations have data integration, right? And, and multiple data points are are as they're spread out. It's good to have constant um, uh, checks and compares running to make sure that stuff is staying in sync and that we're not, you know, due to uh, you know, sync failures or not falling behind in one area and, and, and impacting um, our users. Um, you know, as uh, there is, my, Michael's point is absolutely correct. The, we, we are getting overload with, 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 with more and more data coming in. Um, so just a, a spending time to put a good data strategy um, and data security process in place are, are well worth the, the time investment if, if your organization does not have uh, those things in place, uh, it would be good to start looking into those. No, very good. Thank you both on that. I, I really do love the idea of just, you know, constantly thinking about uh, as we, we look to innovate about what is success. Uh, I think that, you know, it, it, I, I truly believe that, that now we start seeing uh, design thinking elements out there and user experience play more of a role. I, I really start to, you know, see that as being kind of the new wave. And, and then now from, you know, Brian's perspective around managing around that, because it, it's, a, it's a softer, you know, it's just not that hard, and, you know, did I log in? Yes, logged in, all good. So, you know, it's, it's definitely moving away from that into, into more of a, a softer feel. Um, you know, why do people like, you know, aqua versus red? And, you know, that's a, that's a, a fun place to get into, but it it's doesn't have some of the tangible things that we need. But I, I think that's where, you know, we're going to be seeing more and more of uh, in the future. Um, let's take a look at, uh, you know, as we... Wait for it. 
there we go. Um, uh, as we as we kind of talk about some of these, you know, building blocks of, of how we get to innovation, I'd, I'd love Brian and Josh, if you guys could kind of talk a little bit about just some some best practices around these, and you know, if there's a couple of nuggets or one you know big nugget that you'd want people to take away from this, you know, what are what are those thoughts that you'd want our our, our audience to take away from this today? Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I think. Um... I think one area, and I may have alluded to it uh, in earlier slides, but that but that collaboration, this kind of goes into maybe the safe space and brainstorming kind of buckets on screen a bit. Um, but hum one thing that humans can really bring to the table that, you know, I, one of our powerful gifts is, is, is ideation, right? It's the power of ideas. Um, and if we can collaborate together on, on some really, some really good, you know, some smaller low hanging fruit things that are easy to implement and then some grander things that do take more time and, and effort and budget. Um, but if we really invest the time into bridging those relationships across the departments for true collaboration, right? Because sometimes if you get your team together to think of these really cool things that can make everything, make your company run better, it's, it's great, but you're probably missing a big chunk of, of information, right? And so you're limiting yourself um, by not opening up the, the discussion and collaboration and safe space, right? To a to bigger audience that can give new perspective or say, oh, we tried that, but here's why it didn't work. And here's how we could tweak your idea to actually maybe get to a successful uh, outcome. I can, I completely agree with you, Josh. Uh, that safe space really helps harbor innovation for me. Um, and then kind of to couple that with the individual during remote, during remote times like this, project teams, project individuals can feel very siloed, very much alone, even though they could be working for one of the largest companies in the state. Um, with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of coworkers just in the local area, and they can still feel alone and siloed. Um, the, the taskmasters, your SMEs, those are, those individuals are, in, in my opinion, from a project manager standpoint here, that's where innovation can very much start, at least from a bottom up perspective. Obviously, there's innovation from top down as well. Um, but that safe space, understanding, letting ideas flow freely, letting feedback, you know, if, if someone sees, you know, hey, we could be doing this, we could be doing this process a little bit better. But if you don't give them the opportunity to be able to have that voice, to be able to share that insight, um, that's a building block that you're going to be missing in the Tetris that is innovation. You've got to be able to have a standard or a, a, a sturdy foundation. Um, and it all starts with your project teams, in my opinion. Um, it all starts with being able to harness the passions like Josh talked about earlier, harness the passions of each of those individuals that make up your team, that make up the project, that make up the program, that make up the portfolio. Uh, that's, that's, that's my key takeaway for best practices on innovation. No, that's great. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Josh. I, I think those are great, you know, great takeaways as organizations are looking to, you know, innovate into the future. Um, that, that was our, our presentation for today. I, I want to thank uh, Josh Brenneman and, and Brian Whitman uh, so much for, uh, for being our panelists on today's webinar. Uh, at this point in time, we'll, uh, we'll open it up for discussions. Otherwise, thank you again for attending. Uh, we'll uh, record for just a few more minutes and then we'll, uh, we'll stop recording and, uh, and adjourn. But if anyone has any questions, uh, please throw them into the chat. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you hosting for us today. Same here. No problem. Mike Beeger, when it stops snowing and it melts, we'll uh, and hopefully we can all congregate again. I'll come to Iowa. We're gonna we'll go out and golf again. <laughs>